okay so I was saying the assignment the assignment is going to be a, uh, a program that is actually a simulation and the simulation must be done by using a library which is uh, uh, a library has been designed for uh, writing uh, uh, discrete event simulation okay and the library will be available at most this evening at this website and I will ask you to study the library it's not very large it's just a few classes and only two or three of them are re really important and uh, you have to study the examples and understand how to uh, model a simulation and then finally you have to carry on the exercise uh, the uh, deadline for delivering the assignment, uh, uh, I still not decided it. Uh, I said here June 6, uh, maybe June 6 is going to be too early. So it will de actually depends on when we are going to have the, the oral examination in June. Uh, so possible dates. So possible dates are going to be probably uh, Friday 14, I would say, um, and uh, or uh, Monday 17, something like that. Okay. So I'm going to come in Pisa, and uh, and we are going to have the oral. So basically, the project has to be finished. Uh, let's say no later than. 11 12 so that I can have a, a small look at that and then we are going to discuss it together at the exam Okay, so 14 or 17 uh, So what is the project about? So I would ask you to model a wireless communication protocol at a very abstract level of details so basically what I want to, to see is uh, uh, you to model a protocol which simulates collision in the wireless channel okay so the protocol has to be very abstract so basically in our system we are going to have a, a set of nodes that can send and receive messages So you are expected to have uh, uh, like a node here and another node here and another node here okay something like that so this is going to be n1 and 2 and n3 and these are communication nodes so they can send message over the the air okay And every node will have a communication range, which is basically a circle centered in the center here and with a certain radius. So basically, for example, N1 can have a communication range, which is going to be something like this. Okay. So uh, this range is going to include node N2, but it's not going to include N node N3. And then N3, of course, will have a different communication range, which could be this one. Okay. So basically what can happen is that when N1 communicates and send a message, if N3 sends the message at the same time, okay, uh, they are going to collide in this area only okay when uh, in the intersection between the two ranges and so basically n1 will not receive the message and two will not receive the message while uh, for example uh, this other node will receive the message from n1 and this other node we receive the message from N3, okay? Because N4 is going to be out of the range of N3 and within the range of N1.
and vice versa okay um, so this will send message here this is going to send a message here but the same message will collide here so n2 doesn't hear anything okay so basically the assumption we are going to make on this system we want to simulate are first of all all nodes share one single communication channel you can assume all nodes are positioned in an empty 2D space so there are no walls, uh, no obstacles and so no reflection is possible uh, each node has a fixed communication range and we can assume in a first try that all, node have, all nodes have the same communication range so the node can communicate and interfere with nodes within the range it cannot communicate with nodes outside the range so you do not need to write a realistic of, uh, physical mode of the channel you just assume a circle centering the node with constant radius all nodes inside the circle are reachable all nodes outside are not reachable also you can assume constant power and the on on effect so uh, basically uh, you, they communicate or not communicate so uh, N2 is within a range of N1, so it listens perfectly all messages coming from N1, and at the same time, it can listen perfectly to all messages coming from N3, unless they collide. So if they collide, there's going to be interference, of course. So you must model interference. If two nodes send a message at the same time, all nodes within the intersection of the two circles will not receive the message correctly. Now, sending the message takes time, and you have to model this. So you should define message length in terms of uh, number of bits and message transmission time in the, as uh, number of bits per second as parameters of the model. Okay? Uh, then we have to write a very simple physical protocol. A node can hear the channel before sending data. If it is free, you will start sending soon after. So, for example, you can assume that before sending, N1 listen. If it doesn't hear anything, at the next tick, and you have to define what is a tick, will start sending. And the same for entry. It doesn't hear anything, so at the next tick is going to, to send. So, you, at least you avoid two... Uh, nodes in the same range to start sending at the same time okay whatever it means uh, you can also define for example a, back, uh, a backup strategy in the sense that a back off strategy so in the sense that if I see that the channel is busy what do I do do I wait uh, for a random time or do I wait uh, and I start sending as soon as the channel is free well, this is, has to be decided. So you decide the protocol. So at the end, you have to write classes and functions that model the system. So you have to simulate a system consisting of a set of nodes. Huh? And also you have to write tests to show that every class that you write is working as expected. The last thing you are asked to do, of course, to set up a simulation. So I ask you to set up this simulation. You have a a system consisting of a matrix of node and each node has in its range only the immediate neighbors so all node n i j has in its range the node immediately above the node immediately at the left at the right and below okay so it's like a cross n2 has in its range n12 n21 but not n11 okay uh, then each node in the first column will try to send a message to the corresponding node in the last column and each node on the first row tries to send a message periodically to a node in the last row okay and each node in the middle just forwards the message it receives from the left to the right and the message it receives from the top to the bottom okay 
what you have to do is to measure the number of messages effectively received by varying m which is the number of nodes so it's going to be a matrix 3 by 3 4 by 4 or 5 by 5 and by varying the sending period so for example they are going to send every one second more or less randomly or they are going to send every two seconds they are going to send every 10 seconds and so on and I want to know the number of messages that are effectively received on the other end of course in case of collision we just lose the message so we don't care okay of course there's going to be a collision because if these two nodes n21 and n12 sends at the same time there will be a collision on this one okay okay so this is uh, let's say a very um, a fairly first look at the assignment so you already know what I'm talking about however that will, is not going to be the last lecture we do on this so today I hope to finish the part on the templates and uh, and then from Friday we are going to uh, look together at some of the techniques for resolving the exercise in particular we are going to look at this library Metasim and I'm going to explain you how to do things with Metasim and uh, and also we are going to explain a little bit in more details what's going on in this system and how to I'm going to explain a little bit better what happens uh, in the different uh, cases that can uh, arise during the simulation okay so this will be online this evening if you have questions yeah okay so I would say no in the sense that uh, as I said I'm not interested in you to do a, a very realistic or physical model so as a first try let's try to ignore propagation time okay so we are going to say that uh, the nodes are quite close so like in the wireless uh, sensor network scenario that the time it takes for uh, uh, between sending a bit and receiving uh, is going to be uh, very small uh, with respect to the time a node takes to react to external events so the node is going to be slower than the actual speed of light uh, between n1 and n2 other questions okay of course if you have uh, questions in the following days uh, please don't hesitate to ask during the lecture or by email okay okay so we will continue with uh, uh, our uh, template mail programming techniques and let's first do a little bit of summary of what has been done last time so basically we have seen a few techniques for doing uh, metaprogramming and uh, one technique for example was concerned on how to transform uh, a constant into a different type and this is quite easy the only thing you have to do is to write a very stupid class it takes as template parameter an integer or a boolean and stores let's say stores uh, this into an internal constant which is called value okay and uh, the basic trick consists in the fact that you are going to have a different class so a different type for every different value of v so we used this uh, last time uh, to do 
the compile time dispatch. So compile time dispatch means that we are going to decide what to do at the compile time depending on a certain constant. And we have seen that this is not always possible at runtime because uh, the two pieces of code you are going to select, uh, maybe one of them is not going to compile. And so you cannot just run an if because otherwise the compiler will try to compile everything and if everything compiles then later the optimization engine will throw away one of the two branches but before that the compiler needs to actual actually compile everything and this is not uh, possible because one of the two is not going to compile so if we want to do this at compile time what we can do is to use the fact that you can overload a function with different types parameter. So basically the same function can be overloaded with a second parameter which does nothing but exist. And this second parameter uh, is going to be uh, two different types depending on the value of this uh, compile time constant. And, uh, and so uh, only one of the, these two functions is going to be compiled because class my compiler is a template and so if one function is never actually used is not compiled and is not even checked for syntax so if the type here is polymorphic we are going to compile uh, the first one into type true if the type is not polymorphic we are going to compile the second one okay so only one of these in this two is going to be compiled and uh, and we have seen also uh, how to do this in practice um, in our intersect example So basically we have a few functions, uh, they are uh, actually not functions, they are structures, but you can look at them as a sort of uh, meta uh, programming functions, okay? So one of these functions is called uh, uh, iterator traits, and this is a structure that internally has a field called uh, iterator category which is actually a type and this type can be for example standard random access iterator tag okay which means that the iterator ita is a random access iterator tag so if this type is a random access iterator then tag A is the same as random access iterator tag if ETA is not a random access iterator but for example it's simply a bidirectional iterator then this tag A is going to be bidirectional iterator so tag A is actually a type okay and this type depends on this so depends on the type of uh, ITA so tag A stores the category to which ITA belongs and I remind you that ITA can be one between input iterator tag, output iterator tag, forward iterator tag, bidirectional iterator tag, and random access iterator tag. So it can be one of these. Now we want that if 
it's a random access iterator tag, we are going to apply one function, which is the optimized one, this one. So if both e ITA and ITB are random access iterators, then I can sort before intersecting, and the intersection is going to be uh, simpler. So the actual uh, mm, complexity of this function is going to be number of elements in the first um, in the first sequence plus number of elements in the second sequence. Okay, if it is not a random iterator tag, we want to call a less optimized function, which is this, which contains two, four, one inside the other. So basically the complexity now is number of elements in the first sequence multiplied by the number of elements in the second sequence. Okay, multiplied by the time to insert in this, uh, uh, to find uh, to insert uh, in this uh, set, which is going to be in the worst case logarithm of the number of elements inside. Okay. So anyway, this is going to be heavier than the other one. So we would like to use the optimized version when we have vectors. So when the random access iterator is used and to use the less optimized one when we have a normal iterator. Okay. And so what we do is to decide depending on tag A and tag B. So intersect is going to call another function we call intersect opt, which comes in two versions. The generic version, which is the unoptimized one, and the optimized version, which is uh, specialized for random access iterators. Okay? So this is a template function which takes a lot of parameters. The three iterators plus the type of the first iterator and the type of the second iterator. Okay. And the optimized version for two vectors, which takes instead uh, the other one. Okay. Now you could, uh, in general, maybe, uh, you could say, why don't we specialize this directly <laughs> yeah well the problem is that the type of ITA we don't really know so type A and type B are, is not the type of the iterator but rather the category to which they belong the type of ITA is going to be something like this or something like this okay while this one is not the type of the iterator but rather the category to which the iterator belongs okay so we cannot directly write the standard random access iterator tag here to specialize because it's actually not going to work. Okay. So this is the type and this is the category it belongs. And this is another type and you are going to have another category to which it belongs. Okay, so I did this uh, different trick here. Uh, what else? There is another um, facility which I did not explain is this type def here. Uh, this iterator traits we have already seen and we have already seen that internally as something called iterator category and the second 
thing it has inside is a value type, which is actually the value pointed by the iterator. So if we pass vector int iterator, okay, okay, then value type is uh, int. If we say list my class iterator then its value type is going to be my class. So basically it tells us the value type, so the type to which the iterator points. So I just rename this, which is quite long, so this, which is quite long, into value t. And then I build a set of value t. So basically, if this is an integer, then this is a set of integers. If this is a list of classes, my class, then this is going to be a set of my class. Okay? So quite simple. Of course, I don't need this here because I don't need to, to prepare any temporary uh, set. Okay, so this is was for specialization. And uh, sometimes we need something a little bit different. Uh, as you have seen, we cannot apply partial template specialization to function directly. So we have to simulate this with overload. So the trick I've shown you here is actually an overload. It's not a, a, a template specialization. So intersect opt here and the intersect opt there are two different functions. The first one takes, uh, it's a template with uh, five parameters. And the second one is a template with three parameters. And intersect opt is actually an overload on this other intersect opt because has the same name but a different list of parameters okay so this is an overload okay. uh, another example is this uh, this will create a task uh, we create sorry a class by passing a value for the constructor so create here creates a task by calling new by passing a value for the argument of the constructor. Now, suppose you want to specialize this class by using the same function on objects of class widget. However, object of class widget takes two arguments in the constructor. The second one must be minus one. So one thing you can think of doing is to write something like this. I write the general create and then I specialize it like this. Okay. Unfortunately, we have already discussed that this is not possible because these two functions have the same name and the same list of parameters. And so the compiler is not able to distinguish them. Okay? So you cannot do that. So the correct way, sorry, the correct way of doing it is to have a create which takes two arguments. The first one, u, the second one, t, and the second one is going to be a sort of uh, 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 dummy argument. You are never going to use the second argument, and in fact, we not need to name it. So this should be like t x. But since I never use x, I don't name it. 
in this case you can do what you want because the actual specialization is on T and so now the two function can be distinguished because the second argument is going to be different this is a generic T this is widget and so the, sec the second is more specific for widgets so the second create is going to be called so now you can distinguish this create from this create and the compiler is happy so what you need to do is to have a sort of a fake argument that you pass so that you distinguish the two things and in fact this is what we did here look at intersect opt this intersect opt takes a two parameters which you never need so I should say here for example I don't know I should call this uh, uh, TA and I should call this TV but we don't use that there is no reference for TA and TB here, so I don't even say that. So these are two unnamed parameters. And here, again, I should write TA and TB. But again, these are never used that in the following, so I'm not going to say anything. So these are two fake parameters that I create and pass and I never use and are only used for the sake of deciding which of the two functions I'm going to call so that's not very efficient because I'm creating two stupid objects passing them and never using them in some cases the compiler can actually optimize this behavior and don't do not create the two and do not pass the two because they are not actually used so the compiler if it is smart and if uh, it is able to optimize will just cancel this two however from a syntactic point of view they are needed because the compiler needs to distinguish these two functions okay now the two types we are going to pass are actually uh, very stupid so uh, in our example oh I just closed it oh here it is so in our example type A and type B are of class uh, for example random access iterator tag and if you look at the definition of this class this is an empty class there is no member inside and so actually the size of this class is one and so creating the object and passing it has a very small overhead however if you instead your parameter is not small but it's large and if the compiler is not able or we don't want to optimize then this is going to be a heavy thing to do because we are sorry because we are creating a dummy object of type widget and we are not using it now creating a dummy object of type widget could be a very heavy thing to do so how can we avoid this? Well, one way of avoiding this is to use another stupid trick, which is type to type, which depends on a type. So int to type was converting uh, um, an integer into a type. Type to type converts a type into another type. So type to type is a class and it's going to be a different class for a different t. The difference between t and type to type is that type to type is an empty class and the size is one and creating an object of type to type is trivial. So instead of passing widget we are going to pass type to type. Type to type widget is not heavy, does not take anything to create, so even if the compiler does not optimize it away then we can uh, be sure that we are not introducing extra overhead okay so 
Another trick is in uh, writing a function for selecting. Now suppose that in my container we want to store objects in the type if the type is not polymorphic and pointers to object if the type, type is polymorphic. So let's look at the my container class. Remember my container was another example of doing uh, uh, selecting the type based on uh, based on, uh, on in this so basically uh, suppose that uh, we want to decide if to store pointers or to store um, uh, actual elements depending on an external variable okay so we want to customize my container so that we can store pointers or something different, so the entire object, depending on an actual uh, compile time boolean. So how can we do that? Well, we can write this stupid class. Uh, suppose that in internally we use a vector. What type should we give to the vector? T or T star? Well, we can use a select structure like this struct select t result and then a specialization for false it's going to be u so select comes in two flavors the first one takes true as a first argument and then two types and if flag is true then the result is going to be t if a flag is false, instead we have this specialization which tells us that the result is going to be U. So this is basically the same way as writing if if flag then the type should be t else the type is u so if we want to write in a sort of uh, language we should write if flag result t else result The main difference between writing e this and writing what we brought there is that this kind of uh, uh, syntax is not available for programming the compiler. So basically we want to say if flag then the result is t else the result is u and then define a variable of type result so we want to do assignment between types but we cannot use this syntax in metaprogramming so what we do is to write something different we are going to write select flag t u Okay, so the compiler looks at this flag, which must be a compile time constant, and decide if result is t or result is u. Let's look again at how this is realized in the code. It's just two specialization of the same structure. The first one is 
for any flag and the second one is for flag equal to false. So since flag can only assume true or false, then if it's true, then t is going to be the result. Otherwise, u is going to be the result. So this is the equivalent of a if then else in metaprogramming. So in metaprogramming, you are dealing with types and you write things like that and uh, the actual syntax is this. Not very difficult to read after all, right? And so you are going uh, to write something like this. Type def type name. Select is polymorphic t star. Else t result value type. So value type is going to be t star or t depending on the value of is polymorphic. And later on, you can use value type for defining the type of the vector. Okay. Okay, so let's start, uh, before we stop for the break, let's start another trick that is done in metaprogramming. And it, this trick is a little bit complicated. It's actually most complicated things we are going to do in this course probably, which is how to detect inheritance relationship in metaprogramming. So the problem is, given two types, how can we know if two and u are in a relationship of inheritance? For example, we would like to know if u derives from t or not. Because if u derives from t, we want to do something. Otherwise, we want to do something else. Okay? Or maybe our algorithm only works if u derives from t and doesn't work in the other case. So we want to raise an error in case u does not derive from t. An informative error, okay? And also some algorithms may be optimized if an inheritance relationship exists. So we want to detect if T and U are in a relationship of inheritance. How can we do that? Well, the key observation is that inheritance is a special case of convertibility between pointers. So there are only three cases in which we can automatically, automatically means without casting, so there are only three cases in which we can convert from u star to t star. The first case is when t and u are the same type, not the same case, sorry, the same type. So if u and t are the same type, of course, you can convert from u star to t star because you are not actually converting, it's the same type. Or when t is a public base class of u. So if u derives from t, then you can convert u into t, the most derived into the most base, right? Or if t is void, because any pointer can be converted to void. So now the problem is to detect if an automatic conversion exists at compile time. So if we can convert at compile time between u star and t star, then we are one of these three cases. And then maybe we can eliminate the first one and the last one and uh, only retain the second one. Okay? So we are going to check at compile time if we can convert u star into t star. But to do this conversion, we don't want to generate code, of course. There is no point in generating a code. Meta uh, programming uh, consists in letting the compiler do the calculation without reflecting any of this computation on the actual code. Unfortunately, this is not always possible. For example, we have seen that for functions, we have to use the extra parameter for uh, distinguishing two functions. And so there is a little bit of reflection uh, on the generated code. But in general, we should try to avoid this generation whenever it's possible. So we want to check 
this property convertibility from U star to T star without generating code. Now, one way to do that is to use a sides of because sides of is a compile time mechanism of C++ to compute the size of a type. And size of is not a function. It's actually something that the compiler does and substitute with an actual number. So when you see something like uh, okay, size of is not a function. So at runtime, this has no overhead because this thing is computed by the compiler. So the compiler substitutes this code, size of, with that number. Okay? So size of is not a function. Okay? So since this is done at compile time, its argument is not actually evaluated and executed at runtime, but is only evaluated at compile time. For example, if the argument of size of contains a function call, it does not actually invoke the function, but only checks its type. So if we write something like Since this is uh, solved by the compiler, at runtime the function is not actually called, but the compiler looks at this function, looks at the return type, and tries to calculate the size. So if the, my function, for example, returning an integer, this is like size of an integer. But my function is not called, it's just evaluated. Okay, at compile time. Okay, so we are going uh, closer and closer step by step. So we have uh, sides of uh, which doesn't call the function but just checks the return value. Of course, function could be a template. So you could write something like sides of my function. Again, this is not passed, nothing in constructed here. The function is not called, but my type is substituted by the compiler. My function is evaluated for the return type to see what is going to return. Okay? Okay, now my function has to return uh, values. So, since size of returns an integer that we can use in comparisons, we define two types of different sides. So we are defining small as a char and big as two chars. So for sure, size of small is going to be smaller than size of big. Because this as a minimum as one and this as a minimum as two. Actually big can have more than two because it depends on uh, how the compiler aligns the structure. So maybe it can be four characters or it can be even more depending on the, for example, on a 64 bit, this is actually going to take much more than two characters. But the important thing is that the size of small is, la is smaller than the size of big. And this is going to happen in all compilers. So under all compilers, it is guaranteed that the size of small is smaller than size of big. Okay, last step. We want to know if we can convert u into t. And so we are going to write a class that performs this conversion at 
compile time. So in the class conversion, we define small and we define big. Then we define two functions. Test, which takes a parameter of type u and returns a small. And another test that takes anything, when you write three dots, this means that this test takes anything and returns a big. Okay? And finally, we have a function, make t, which builds a t. Last step, exist is a constant, which is going to be a boolean, which is the result of this comparison. Sides of test make t equal equal sides of small. Okay, so now you need to evaluate this. Make t returns a t. So, test of t. Which one I'm going to call? There is no test of t here. So either we call test that takes u or we call test that takes anything. We call test that takes u only if you can convert a t into a u. So if you can convert a t into a u, then the size of test make t is going to be the size of small, which is going to be the same as the size of small, and so exist is true. If you cannot convert t into u, then the only possibility is to call the second test, and this will return big. And so size of big is not the same as size of small, and so exist is going to be false. So if you can convert t into u, then exist is true. If you cannot convert t into u, then exist is false. And so finally, we have, have been able to check if you can convert t into u. Okay, so I think it's time for a break. <laughs> Sorry, this is a little bit uh, involved, I know. And uh, so I will leave you 10 minutes to rest before going uh, ahead. Thank you.